Before we get into the video today, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Gnostic TV. Gnostic TV is ancient wisdom reimagined. This is a Netflix for those who are spiritually curious and want a place to go where there is no censorship. I personally am doing a whole series on Gnostic TV called the Esoteric Explorer, where I am providing exclusive content to Gnostic. Gnostic TV is a host to all sorts of different content creators, many of whom are your old favorites. If you would like to check out Gnostic TV, there is a link down in the description box below. According to historyofdolls.com, a doll is a figure of a human being or sometimes of an animal used often as a child's toy or in magic and religious rituals. Now we have covered a few haunted dolls on this channel before, but today we're going to look at some more dolls that might not necessarily be haunted, but in my opinion, might have more of a sinister background. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, such a big thank you to all of our patrons and our producers here on Esoteric Atlanta. Without your funding and without your support, this channel would not be possible. If you would like to help support the work here on Esoteric Atlanta, there is a link down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce and today, we're going to be talking about witchcraft and dolls. Some of the oldest dolls that we have date back to ancient Egypt, and these are called wooden paddle dolls. Now, I don't think that's what the ancient Egyptians called them. I'm pretty sure that's a more modern term because they're literally flat dolls made out of wood. Now, these could have been dolls used for toys. However, most archaeologists believe that these dolls were used by adults for ritualistic purposes, including fertility, and also as perhaps a companion for a deceased loved one. We know that the ancient Egyptians had very, very unique rituals when it came to the passing of people. And so again, many, many archaeologists believe that some of these dolls, these original dolls, were placed in the graves of loved ones to assist them in their journey to the underworld. Even though dolls are technically some of the oldest toys found in the world, it does seem in some of my research that in most purposes, historically speaking, dolls were not viewed as toys, but again, rather as a tool for magic or rituals. Historically, we see the use of dolls throughout the world, including Africa and Asia. Even the Native Americans had dolls made out of corn husk and dried apples. Now, the Native Americans, for a lot of the tribes, the, the Native American nations, these dolls did not have faces on them, which also reminds me of our modern day Amish dolls. If you're interested in more of the history of dolls in different cultures, I'm going to link the website historyofdolls.com down in the description box under show notes. Now most of us probably when we think of dolls we think of more porcelain dolls. I know growing up my mother liked to get us porcelain dolls as well as Madame Alexander dolls that my sister and I were not allowed to play with. They were more to be like decoration in our bedrooms. Nonetheless porcelain dolls originated in Germany in 1860, and this was during the Victorian era. 
What I find interesting about the Victorian era is that when you say the Victorian era, most people know exactly what era you're talking about, even though this was based off of the reign of Queen Victoria in England. For some reason, the Victorian era, the name kind of stuck globally. Even countries like my own and perhaps your country watching are, aren't connected to the monarchy of the English family. We still understand the Victorian era. The Victorian era, again, spans the reign of Queen Victoria. As most of you know, she is one of my five times great-grandmothers. Along with a lot of people watching right now, she literally has thousands of descendants in the royal family and outside of the royal family like myself. But nonetheless, Queen Victoria's reign lasted... From the 20th of June, 1837 to the 22nd of January, 1901. Now, in my opinion, if I got to travel back in time, the Victorian era is definitely a fascinating one that I would consider traveling back to. We have these massive opposing forces happening in the Victorian era. We're seeing extreme conservatism come around. We're also seeing spiritualism come around. And we've also got a bunch of people who have a very macabre look at death. The Victorians, besides like the ancient Egyptians, the Victorians or the people of the Victorian era, especially in the Western world, took a very a more like ritualistic approach to death, very different from generations prior. They took things like death photos, which we all know are super creepy. They also would do things like if your grandmama passed away, you would like cut some of her hair off and make like mourning jewelry. So you'd make like a bracelet with her hair. We also see the the coming of the um, mourning attire, which I did not know until doing this research on the Victorian era that mourning attire was created at this time where people would dress in black for a certain amount of time after a loved one passed. You know, we also got this saying, leaving feet first. That comes from the Victorian era as well. If somebody passed away in their home, when their, when their body was removed, they would always have the corpse exit the house feet first in order to bring, not bring bad luck onto the home. One of the creepiest, creepiest things about the Victorian error and their their view on death is something called a mourning doll now remember what i said throughout history it does seem that even though dolls were the oldest toy ever found it does however seem that they most likely in most situations were used by adults for some other purpose but play in the Victorian era, as we were coming to the end of the 19th century, we're taking more of a modern approach to children. <laughs> Funnily enough, this is also the time period where if you are a conspiracy theorist, you believe that incubator babies were coming into the scene. That's why at this, at this time in history, we had an influx of orphanages and workhouses with children. I covered this a while ago, almost two years ago, it's one of my most viewed videos with the child strike of 1899. I will tag that down below if you missed that, where all of a sudden children are just appearing everywhere. Now, the mainstream narrative will tell you that because of the conservativeness of the Victorian era, when women would get pregnant out of wedlock, often they would take their children, their illegitimate children, to an orphanage or to a workhouse. This allegedly was to protect the child from the label of illegitimacy so the child could be perhaps adopted into a family. And it would also protect the chastity and the purity and the integrity of the woman so that she could appear to be pure, hoping to, you know, score a husband. But as most of us come into this age of awakening and questioning things, the math just ain't mathin'. Because at the end of the 19th century, when apparently there was this big child boom, um, I was going to say baby boom, but that's an actual generation that my parents are a part of that happened in the 20th century. But this child boom, the math ain't mathin'. Like, there cannot be that many women getting that knocked up 
dropping that many children off at orphanages and at workhouses. In big cities like New York or London, children literally ran the streets, again referring back to the child strike of 1899 in New York City, where the children literally shut the city down. That was how many of them were parentless, like we're talking eight, nine, ten years old, parentless, working in workhouses. They were newsies. They were selling newspapers. So a lot of people are coming to this realization that there's another story here, that these children weren't just orphans or abandoned children because their mothers were not married to their fathers. No, there's something else going on here. But again, that's a story for a different day. In the Victorian era, even though we have this abundance of children, parents, those that kept their children, started to have more of a nurturing relationship with their children. In the past, children had of course, parents always love their kids, absolutely, but there was a different dichotomy, right? There was a different relationship, different time. A lot of children did not live very long. Um, there were many children in the family, and a lot of times they were, only if you were like super rich did you get any real form of formal education. A lot of times children were kind of put to work at a very young age to help the family. They, of course, had no understanding at this time of mental development and how the child's brain develops over time and of course our frontal lobe isn't even done developing until we're like 25 years old so there was not a lot of nurturing for a huge part of our history especially in the western world when it came to children however again in the victorian era we're starting to move towards this idea of nurturing children or perhaps having a better understanding of the co somewhat coddling and, and, and holding that kids actually need. And with that came a bigger bond between parent and child. Again, not saying that there wasn't a bond back hundreds of years ago, but it was just very, very, very different, especially for families of aristocracy, right? Because where a peasant family would need the child to start working on the farm or in the factory or whatever, the aristocracy off often would have their children and then pass their children off to a, a nanny. We even have things like nursemaids where women, other women would breastfeed their children. And so this, this personal relationship with your parents as a child was not common. And at the end of the 19th century, it was starting to become more common. Of course, coming into the 20th century, with the creation of the Federal Reserve, we also now start to see the inception of child labor laws. We also start to see the inception of children by law having to go to school with the creation of public schools or government schools. Um, where children now have to be in school and not working all day in a factory. So we're kind of on the precipice. So of course, before change happens, there's usually a domino effect, a snowball building up to that change actually happening. And again, that was the Victorian era. So when children would pass away in the Victorian era, parents started this fad of creating morning dolls and you guys this is one of the most creepy things i have ever studied in my whole entire life so what would happen when the child would pass away at whether it be a baby or an actual child and this was only afforded to those who could afford it right like the aristocrats they would have a doll made in the likeness of the past or the deceased child now, when I say made in the likeness, I mean in the literal likeness. If you had a three-year-old, the child would be created like a three-year-old. If you had an eight-year-old, the child would be created size, shape, like an eight-year-old. Same thing with an infant. These child, these baby dolls, these, they were made from wax in sandbags. They would place the sandbags in certain places of the doll so that when you pick the doll up, it actually felt like a real child. These morning dolls were also made with the hair of the deceased child. So... When the child passes away, and, and I can't imagine the heartbreak, and I know heartbreak and grief do make us do very strange things, parents would have these dolls created. And they would be able to hold these dolls 
as if they were holding their own child, which of course they can't because the child itself is going to start the de decomposition process, right? And so they would put their grief into these dolls. Now, from a very innocent, pure perspective, this sounds like something that could aid a parent in the processing of losing a child. And again, I, I can't imagine how painful that must be. However, on this channel, we do know a thing or two about magic. And I can't help but wonder if there's a more sinister purpose behind these mourning dolls. For example, we know that dolls today used in magical rituals are called poppets. They're also known as a moppet, and this is a doll created in the likeness of a person for the purpose of magic. They can be made from roots, grain, corn shafts, fruit, paper, clay, etc., and they, poppets, are used for both good and bad. A lot of people will call a poppet like a kitchen witch, which is typically a doll that's put into kitchens, kitchens to ward off bad energy. Now, that's interesting to me because being from the South, I think of a kitchen witch as being something totally different. Um, a kitchen witch in my local language is more of a woman who knows a little bit about magic and maybe practices a little bit of magic, maybe put some salt here and there or puts you pick kind of like a, a very amateur witch. And that's a lot of us here in the South. Maybe bury some amulets in the backyard. That is my definition of a kitchen witch, meaning it's not a, a full, she's not a full on witch or practitioner. She just does some things here and there. But according to the poppet folklore, a kitchen witch, again, is a, is a doll that you specifically put in the kitchen. It's supposed to ward off bad energy. We also know there are things like voodoo dolls, although the voodoo faith has definitely kind of pushed back from Hollywood's perception of voodoo dolls, which I don't blame them. I definitely think Hollywood has really um, instigated propaganda around around voodoo dolls. We also, again, see this in, in the Haitian culture, and dolls are used for significant magic, right? You, you take the energy and you put it in the object. That's why we have things like Robert the doll, which, again, we've covered. Again, that will be down below. And the energy that Robert holds is not the actual object that's, that's the magic, but it's whatever is the, the object is housing whatever spirit the object is housing is, is the magic. We also know that when it comes to spirits, we have many different types of spirits, the most common being ghost. A ghost is a disembodied spirit. It's, a, it's an earthbound spirit that used to be in a human body like you and me, and then once the body was done and it was time to move on, the energy of that person, for whatever reason, decided to stay and stick around and not move into the light. We also have things like demons and angels, which are archons or whatever you want to call them, entities of a higher density that are either polarized positive or negative, but we're never human. We also have something called a poltergeist, and that is more of where my mind is going and my critical thinking skills when it comes to these mourning dolls and perhaps some of the dolls that are used for more nefarious purposes. A poltergeist, unlike a ghost or a demon, is an entity or a spirit that's created specifically by the emotion of a human. Poltergeist then become entities themselves, independent entities, but you are their creation. This is why we see a lot of poltergeist activities with young teenage girls because their emotions are through the roof. And so that energy has to go somewhere. And so when you've got a, a girl, especially a girl that might be under ABUSC in the house, SA, something like that, that energy is going to create its own entity outside of the girl. Now, obviously, in these situations, most of the time when someone creates a poltergeist, they don't mean to. It's not something they're intentionally doing. It's just the energy becomes so great that it almost becomes kinetic and has to actually leave the body. Now, when this happens in most cases, when a poltergeist is created, especially in like houses, the poltergeist won't necessarily follow the family. It's not, it's not at the mercy of the person who created it, right? It will stay in the house and it usually will mess with everybody in the house, including the person who created it.
So my perspective on morning dolls and some other magic dolls is that what is happening is the grief, the overwhelming grief of the parents losing their children is being pushed into this object, creating almost a poltergeist. And again, poltergeist, a lot of times people see them as evil. I don't really believe they're actually evil. I just think they're chaotic because they're they live they they they're created from chaotic energy so therefore they themselves create chaos now here's where it gets even creepier so at the wake or the funerals of these children the parents would hold the mourning doll and not only would the parents the grieving parents hold the mourning doll but they would pass the mourning doll around to everybody else in attendance Funerals are sad anyway. It doesn't matter if you were close to the person or you just know the person. They're always emotional when you're actually grieving the passing of a human being. And, and of course, for the people that were close to the person, to the deceased, the, the realization, the shock, the knowledge that you're never going to see this person again in this life is sometimes a really heavy energy to, to bear. My ear is itching. So maybe that means, doesn't it mean when your ear itches that you're saying something true? So maybe I'm on to something. We'll see. We'll see if this, this video gets shadow banned or not. Um, so anyway, you've got all these people, not just the family members, but close family friends that are holding this doll. All this energy is being rubbed off on this doll. And what would typically happen, though, is once the coffin was sent to the graveyard, a lot of parents would leave the doll at the graveyard. And this still, you still kind of see this today. I've talked about this a lot, especially with cemeteries, down old cemeteries, especially down here in the South. People will go and leave stuff at, at graves. They'll leave marbles. They'll leave coins. They'll leave toys. If it's a child, they'll leave alcohol for the people, beers, uh, shots of vodka, whatever. Um, People are, are very active still to this day in the South in cemeteries. So that's not weird to me. Leaving, leaving dolls at a cemetery is not weird to me at all. In fact, if you remember from a past video I did over Salem, which if you missed that video, I'll share that below as well. It is my opinion that nothing happened in Salem. I think that's a, um, a distraction. I think the witch trials actually happened somewhere else. Because when I was in Salem, I was like, this is nothing. There is nothing here. I mean, I'm from the South, y'all. I grew up Charleston, Savannah, New Orleans, St. Augustine. Like there is way more energy, way more of a heaviness in those towns than there. Salem doesn't feel like anything. And, and when you go in the graveyards in Salem, you can't touch the graves. Why? It's not because they're old, because we got graves older in the South that people can touch all the time. And the graves themselves look like they come from Party City. They don't look real. So I have my suspicions that the reason why they don't let you touch the graves is because they're not real. That's just my, that's my opinion. But nonetheless, um, and I also find it strange, you, you couldn't do that here in the South because of the voodoo faith, because of the, the, the magic of the South. We all, we're all a little witchy down here in the South. People would never stand for that because we do put things on graves. We touch graves all the time. We are always putting trinkets and stuff on our loved ones graves even people that passed away a couple hundred years ago so you couldn't tell a southerner not to touch a grave that's just not going to work so again back to my point the morning dolls being left on graves are not that weird to me but some parents would not leave the morning dolls on the grave they would take the doll home with them and continue to care for the doll like it was their own child and that in my opinion is where it gets a little psychotic now, I know back in the Victorian era, they didn't have things like therapy. You probably needed therapy if you're doing something like that. In fact, even today, we're seeing an emergence of this idea of a morning doll and the rebirth dolls. And I had watched the series Servant where they do Jericho. I, I'm not sure which platform it's on, but there is a series called Servant where it's about a rebirth doll, which I thought that was just for the series. I didn't realize until I started doing this research that this is actually starting again these morning dolls and this is specifically for like parents who have a late-term miscarriage or have a stillborn where they're giving a rebirth doll and a rebirth doll is an infant that is shaped in the likeness of the baby that they passed that just like the victorian morning dolls parents use to grieve 
And if you want to talk about magic and dolls, I would suggest watching the show Servant because I think that they tell us a lot of truth in Hollywood, obviously. And this is weird to me because energy is be being put into this doll. Okay. Energy is being put into this doll. Dolls are heavily used in witchcraft. Why? Now, again, some dolls are used positively in witchcraft. Just because it's witchcraft doesn't mean it's bad. I mean, the word witch just means a wise woman, right? So throughout history, we, we see incidents where people are creating puppets or magic dolls in order to help someone get healthy, you know, with their consent. But this seems to be something more nefarious because I don't think that they're telling parents at the hospital when they're given these rebirth dolls that this is this could happen that energy could be trapped within the doll i think that this, there's something else going on i don't know what it is love to hear your opinions on that now before we talk about one more phenomenon that's super weird when it comes to doll babies we're going to take a brief word from one of our sponsors. And this sponsor is Spooky2. As you guys know, Spooky2 is a company that really believes that you should have the power to take your own health back. They work off of vibrational energy. And they're also a sister company to Miramate. Miramate is also the same type of technology as Spooky2, which is uh, basically te Tesla technology. But they both have different purposes. Spooky2 is more machinery whereas Miramate is more like a pad that has the electrons in it to help you balance out your chakras and balance out your body. Now with both Spooky 2 and with Miramate, if you enter my name, Bryce Watson, B-R-I-C-E, W-A-T-S-O-N at checkout for any purchases you make for either company, you will get 5% off of your purchase. Now, again, if you are interested in these products and in taking your own health back and rebalancing your chakras and your vibrational body, but you're really confused and you're not that great at technology, believe me, I'm not that great at technology either, both Spooky2 and Miramate have incredible customer service, especially Brad. Brad Brad's been on my channel multiple times talking about Tesla technology and this, this equipment. So don't be afraid, even if you feel like this stuff is too over your head, but you really want to try it. Don't be afraid of it because Brad or anybody else at both Miramate and Spooky2 will sit down with you, will talk you through it, will help you figure out which product is going to be best for you. So if that's something you're interested in, all those links, both those websites are down in the description box below. And before we get on into the last doll we're going to talk about today, let's hear a brief commercial from Spooky 2. Hi, Joan, Echo, and the Spooky 2 team. This is Kanika here, and I'm here to share not just my and my partner's Spooky 2 journey. Spooky 2 has been superbly special for my partner and I am actually sitting in the scalar field. In our personal experiences, my partner and I have uh, literally gone off all our, our vitamin and multivitamin, multivitamin and mineral supplements. We hardly take them. We used to take them to support and supplement our well-being. But I've been using the daily wellness protocol and my hair has just exploded in its growth. The skin's gotten uh, beautiful. The DH experimental frequencies, I've been experimenting with a lot of them. We have such good strength in our body. We don't fall ill to an extent that my partner has hay fever. Peter, he has hay fever, but this time, I've started using the Immune Super Booster and oh my God, it is magic. Uh, we recently this year purchased the remotes as well. So we use our DNA clipping and we put our clippings in it. And uh, it's just been so beautiful and profound. And I have always been, so I pray daily, I meditate daily. And I've been sitting in the scalar field and meditating and praying and my psychic abilities, my connection to the divine, if I just want to put it in a nutshell, is just increasingly becoming so potent. I've been using the 12 strand DNA activation as well and the DH experimental frequencies just to see how it goes. And the, the effects 
are so magnificent in our, on our physical bodies and our like um, energetic field. I'm an energy healer. I take clients through um, quantum healing sessions while sitting in the field so that they can also, I can be a clearer conduit and send these energies as well by pure quantum entanglement, right? And if people were to not believe this, all this physical proof shows what a gem of a product this is. I can't like recommend this more to anybody like so yes much love and gratitude thank you for listening and uh, i could share so much more but i'd like to wrap this up now thank you you know what they say guys if you don't have your health you don't have anything so again if you're interested in spooky 2 or mirror mate please don't hesitate to contact their customer services to speak to a representative to help you figure out what's good for you or if you already know what's good for you if you're good at this stuff you can just go ahead and check out but do not forget to use my name because you do get a five percent discount so the final doll that we're going to talk about today comes from my neck of the woods and this is the time out doll now, I vaguely remember timeout dolls from my childhood. They were started in the 90s, and you could find them in, like, flea markets and, like, car shows. Nobody knows who the original creator of the timeout dolls was, but we do know it started in Appalachia. So timeout dolls are dolls that are about, you know, the size of, like, a four- or five-year-old, who don't have faces, their hands cover their faces, and they're positioned against a wall or in a corner like they're in time out. Now, when they were being displayed at car shows, a lot of people believe that these dolls were used to cover flaws in the cars, you know, just as like a gimmicky little thing. These dolls, though, sometimes at the flea markets would have notes on them saying, my parents don't want me please take me home. A lot of kids who grew up with the timeout dolls said that their parents would, when they would send them to timeout, they would tell them to go stand by the doll. So the doll became a marker of where timeout was going to be. So can you imagine that? Having to go stand in timeout by a creepy ass doll that just sits there with its face on the wall. Now, the timeout dolls are so lifelike that many times cops have been called because people will see the backside of this doll and think that it, it, it is in distress and call the police. And if you're from Appalachia or from the South and you had a timeout doll, I would absolutely love to hear your experience with this timeout doll because a lot of people do have paranormal phenomenon. There's many stories of, of people or kids hearing the doll talk to them. Um, there's one story, some people call these dolls hide and go seek dolls because the doll not only looks like it's in timeout, but looks like it might be counting to play hide and go seek. There are stories of, of kids like hearing it counting, like it's ready or not, here I come, it's gonna come fine, like Chucky. I mean, that's a doll, right? You know, so I would love to hear from you. We did not have timeout dolls. I, like I said, we had like Madame Alexander dolls and porcelain dolls. And listen, my mother is very house proud. She's very house proud. My mother's family is very house. My great grandmother's house was in Southern Living. What I'm Southern Living, for those that don't know, is a magazine down here in the South of very fine aristocratic homes. So growing up, I did not have the luxury of like hanging posters on my wall. Like our bedrooms, my siblings in my bedroom were pristine. Like we had paintings on our wall. It was definitely decorated like a little girl's room, but it wasn't. I wasn't allowed to like make it a teenager's room. And so we would have these like secretaries in our bedrooms, which were like glass cases with our dolls in them, you know, and then on the wall paintings and, and it, it just, um, yeah, it, it was, uh, definitely, um, 
my mother definitely was not the mother that was going to let us do what we wanted. And so we did have like porcelain dolls and Madame Alexander dolls that we weren't allowed to touch or play with. We also had dolls we played with in our playroom. And even in the playroom growing up, if we wanted to like hang a poster, my mother would have the poster framed. All right. So that's, I did not grow up in a house where there would have been a timeout doll. That would have not been classy enough for my mother. So I, I never experienced this, but I would love to hear if you had. I did, however, grow up things with like, like Teddy Rupskin. I wish my mother had kept my Teddy Rupskin because I'm sure that sucker would be worth quite a fortune. And I can't help but wonder what Teddy Rupskin was all about now. You know, I had trolls, troll dolls. I know Jesse DeBoder has spoken about the trolls. Nonetheless, there is definitely something very, very nefarious. Now, I ended with the timeout dolls because, again, the timeout dolls are believed it's believed that their inception happened in Appalachia. Well, there is another doll that is from Appalachia that I've spoken about from time to time on this channel. I know that on Aquarius Rising Africa, Caleb have spoken about these dolls, and I am going to definitely be doing a deep dive myself into these dolls and perhaps going to their factory because I live very close to it, and these are the Cabbage Patch Kids. So stay tuned, guys, because we are going to be looking more into these dolls, the urban legends around these dolls, and maybe exploring more sinister purposes for something that looks as innocent as a child toy. Now, once again, I hope you're having a wonderful day and I cannot wait to hear your experiences and your thoughts and your opinions down in the comment section below.